Come on in. I'm so glad you came to visit today. I've been missing you. I so enjoy these chats we have. So I understand that um, you've been struggling a bit between loss and trying to find your gratitude again. I'm, I'm so honored that you asked for my advice. Um, I'm not a professional, you know that, but you know my background and I'd like to give you a little bit of what I've learned about loss and gratitude. I lost a lot all at once. Um, we tried to have a family and I had four losses, one after the other. During the last loss, um, my father was diagnosed with cancer and passed two months later. Um, a few years later, my, um, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer and five weeks after diagnosis, she passed. And then we lost both my in-laws very shortly, about less than a year after my mom, we lost my father-in-law. And three years later, we lost my mother-in-law. They were hard times, but we got through them together, my family and I. But one thing I want to talk about with loss, and I promise this won't be a heavy conversation, or I hope it's not for you, is gratitude. Um, I learned about gratitude and gratitude journaling years and years and years ago, um, from Oprah, actually. And I love the idea of it. And to me, writing in a gratitude journal I always pick five things that I'm grateful for that day. And they can be anything. They can be um, the muffins I love at Tim Hortons were just baked, or um, I got to speak to someone I haven't spoke to in a while, or I laughed so hard today at a TV show. It could be anything, anything small, anything big, you know. Some days, honestly, it's, I am glad this day is done. Um, but something I learned about gratitude during everything uh, that's happened to me is I always try to find something to be grateful for. Those are the days I search the hardest and usually those are the days that mean the most. So have you tried? I no, I understand. I understand. How can you be grateful when you feel like your heart is breaking? What I try to look at is grateful for the time I did have with someone. Um, with both my parents, we knew they were passing. My dad, it was harder. A, it was our first loss. And B, he was so young. He was only 63. In my 20s, that appeared ancient, but now I feel like that's so young. Um, but we were able to say things. And there were times right near the end, especially that last week, we had moments that I'll never forget, that um, stayed with us. Um, there was one moment, it's, okay, you have to understand my sense of humor. We have very dark Irish senses of humor in my family. And my father and I were very close. When my dad was diagnosed, my husband said to a friend of his, I don't know anyone closer to their dad than Kim is. And we, um, my mom had to go out. Um, she was actually going to the funeral home to plan things at my dad's insistence. And she said, are you sure you're okay here alone with your dad? I'm like, no problem. We'll play cards, we'll talk. Everything will be just fine. And it was until he said, he had this awful look on his face. And I'm like, are you in pain? He goes, mm, -mm. I said, is something wrong? And he goes, I have to go to the bathroom. And I went, okay. Um, at that time he had a colostomy bag and I said, I can change the bag, that's not a problem. It doesn't bother me, you know that. He goes, uh-uh, I have to pee. And at that point we both looked at each other in complete shock because at that point he couldn't get up and walk to the washroom. He had a, a bottle, a medical bottle that he used. And he goes, my arm's not, I don't have any strength. I can't hold it. And I'm like, we will figure this out. We will make this work. He goes, I don't know, Kim. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he sat on the edge of the bed. This is such a personal story, but I want you to see that there can be laughter and 
joy even in the smallest, weirdest moments. He had on boxers. So I took the bottle and I put it up the leg. I said, you guide, you guide, <laughs> tell me when it's there. And I wouldn't look and I was looking away like this and we managed to get it done. So that was good. But the whole time we were laughing, he goes, this is ridiculous. And that could have been a moment where we both were maudlin and, oh, this is so sad, but it wasn't. And I think about that moment so much, not the peeing part, obviously, but the part where I shared this moment with him and we were laughing. Um, even the, the last day, he wasn't conscious. He was, was in a coma at that point. And, and he died at home like he wanted to. And everyone had said goodbye but me. And my brother said, are you going to let him go? I said, yeah, finally. Because I didn't want to. And my mom was on one side, I was on the other, and I lifted his hand up and I said, Dad, no, I hadn't lifted his hand yet. I said, Dad, if you need to go, it's okay. We'll be okay. We'll take care of each other. I said, all you have to do is reach up and touch God's hand. And I held up his arm and I said, I'll help you do it. I'll help you do it. And I thought, you know what? That's a really sweet moment. This is a good thing. I looked over at my mother who was looking at me like, how did I raise this person? And she goes, you watch way too much Touched by an Angel Girl. <laughs> he did pass less than an hour later, though. And then with my mom, when she went into the hospital, um, we thought it was pneumonia because she would get pneumonia, you know, every couple of years. And it was stage four lung cancer. And she had quit smoking, like, 40 years before then. So it was a shock to all of us. But my mom knew, I think, that she was going to go and she was at peace with it. And she was the one helping all of us. But again, we had these funny moments that we would all, you know, find to laugh at. And, and I remember she would always sing to us when we were kids, Puff the Magic Dragon. And she sang it to all her grandchildren and her great-grandchild. And I would lay there and I would rub her hair and I would sing Puff the Magic Dragon to her. And she opened her eyes one, one morning and she said, have you been into my pain meds? <laughs> and we just started laughing. We all have very sarcastic senses of humor. And we also believe in signs. And when my mom decided to stop chemo, they um, put her in a private room on the palliative floor. And there was a beautiful picture across from her. And it was a garden scene, a garden gate with beautiful flowers everywhere. And my brother was standing beside it and I saw him with a puzzled look on his face and he calls me over. He goes, look at the title of the picture. Now, I look over and it said Millie's Garden. My mother's name was Millie, but on all the hospital forms, it was Mildred. And that's all the nurses ever called her, even though I would keep telling them. And I asked the nurse who put her in the room if she knew that. And she said, no, honey, that's the sign just for your mama which I thought was a very sweet thing to say. Um, and even that night when she was passing, they called it actively passing. My brother and I were there and he was wearing this heavy shirt and the room was so hot. And he said to me, do you mind if I take my shirt off? I'm dying from this heat. I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I've seen you shirtless. No, that's not a problem. He's my younger brother. I'm like, yeah. So I happened to look away to talk to my mom. Well, talk. She was in a coma, but I was talking to her. And I look up and he's gone. I'm like, where did he go? He has a spare hospital gown on laying on the floor. I said, oh my God, would you be better? They're going to take you somewhere. They're going to think you're a patient. We laughed so hard. And then... I would always give my mom a weather report when we were 
when I was visiting her. And, you know, I'd say, well, it's, you know, windy, sunny, because she couldn't see, she could see the lights, but she couldn't see out the window from where she was sitting. So after she passed, um, she passed at five in the morning, but the nurse said we had till eight to stay in the room with her, which was a blessing because it was peaceful. It was quiet, all the machines had stopped. We could just be, you know? And I looked outside and I said, hey mom, it's beautiful outside. There's just the slightest bit of a breeze. It's sunny. It's warm. It's the perfect day to learn to fly. And I told my daughter that and she said, and she was only 11 at the time. And she said, I always knew Nanny would get her wings, <laughs> which made me feel really, really good. But nothing was left unsaid. We all were able to say how much we loved each other, how much we forgave each other. That was a big thing. Um, my mom was a work in progress for sure, but my mother was also the perfect example of when you know better, you do better. And she never stopped learning. Oh my goodness. She never stopped. And then I'll talk about my babies. I'm not going to talk too much about the losses. Um, one was a ruptured atopic. I miscarried twins at just about 12 weeks, and then I had an early miscarriage. Um, I don't know your faith. I mean, we have talked about faith before, but for me, you know that I believe in the souls are there at conception. And I know that my babies are waiting for me somewhere and that they're loved. And I've already told the story of my dad and, and my daughter and how he sent her to me. I'm grateful though. I was grateful I could be pregnant. I was grateful for every moment I was pregnant with them. Um, I've done all, as much of my um, gratitude as I can. And gratitude to me, it's acknowledging, seeing the good where the bad is in a lot of ways. It's easy to be grateful for something great happens. That's easy. When something bad happens, to look for the gratitude in that, that can be difficult. Um, but I know you can do it. I have so much faith in you. Oh, honey, don't cry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But loss of a loved one, loss of a relationship, loss of a job, loss of an opportunity, they're never endings. There is always something around the corner for you. And I'll hold your hand while you walk that corner. The biggest thing we can do for each other is be there for each other through everything. I'm so grateful that we can have this chat, that we can visit with each other. Um, people always say, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And one thing I've learned going through the health issues I'm going through right now is who to be grateful for. And I don't get angry at the people who aren't around. Not everyone can be, you know, not everyone can handle. When we had all those losses, a lot of people disappeared from my life, you know, and then came back when everything was normal again. But I don't blame them. Not everyone can be there for someone. I think people are in your life for a reason. Not everybody's there for a long, but always, always for a reason. I hope that helps. Um, I really, really recommend gratitude, a gratitude journal. Um, I used to teach Sunday school years and years ago, and I taught it for a long time. And I always had small classes, maybe five to eight kids. That's about it in my grade. And I used to teach grade fives, and then I taught grade eight, getting ready for their confirmations. And I always gave them each a journal. And I told them as long as they were in my class, I expected them to use a gratitude journal every night, but that I trusted them um, and that I would never ask to read them. It was their business. Whether they continued it or not was their business. I do know 30 years later of at least two who still keep their gratitude journals, um, which I love. <laughs> um, they did, however, ask to see mine one day. So I did bring in this pile of gratitude journals. I didn't let them read, read them. I just opened them to show them. And um, I just really believe in it. 
And what's a better way of going to sleep at night than thinking of the good things? Than sleep, than blah, sleeping, than thinking of the things you're grateful for. It puts you to sleep on a positive note. And um, on that note, I know you said, I know that you've said you're having trouble sleeping. And um, I strongly recommend ASMR videos. They really seem to help people sleep. Another, I totally believe in visualization. And there's two visualizations that I use that I'd love to share with you if you're willing to hear them. Okay, great. The first one is I envision a chalkboard. Yes, you know what a chalkboard is. I know you're younger than I am, but they had them in schools. They're blackboards that you write on. Sometimes they're dark green. Anyways, smart ass, get a piece of chalk in your brain and write down what's bothering you, what's keeping you up, okay? And then get an eraser and make sure it's a, in your mind, it's a huge eraser and erase everything. And then get a damp cloth and just wipe it because there's nothing that looks nicer than a freshly washed chalkboard. It has a shine and a gloss and it's clean. That's one way I visualize. Another visualization that I do is um, an elevator where I'm going up, up, up. And at each floor, I realize I'm getting tired. I'm relaxing. I'm letting go of certain muscles. I try sinking into whatever I'm laying on, whether it's a bed, a chair, whatever. When it opens, I personally love clouds. I love anything celestial and to do with the sky. So I envision clouds on a starlit night and I lay down and the cloud kind of forms a blanket around me and I kind of sink in and I just feel safe and comfortable. And those two things help me a lot when I try to go to sleep. Um, and I hope that helps you. Um, as I say, losses happen to everyone. And the only thing I can tell you, I have a sign upstairs in our office and it says I can sum up everything I've learned about life in three words it goes on and it will for you too it will go on and it will get better I promise okay now can you please close your eyes close them I know you're opening them all right think of five things right now you're grateful for I can tell you right now that your visit is at the top of my list. So as always, I love you, I value you, and I honor you.